project to try uh, to try to give students the opportunities uh, to um, think through about what careers in tech, different aspects of technology law. So we try to encourage a diverse group of people from a different parts of, this, of, of technology law, but also at different stages in their career. And uh, we are delighted to welcome Teddy Josephson today, who is a 2019 graduate of the law school, who remembers not that long ago when she was in your position trying to figure out what direction she's gonna take. Now, before we get to talking to Teddy, uh, there's some housekeeping things we need to take care of. As you just saw from that notice that splashed across the screen, this is being recorded and will be posted online for other people to share, the people who could not make it today. So uh, please be aware of that and uh, be, just be uh, uh, know that that's going to happen. And if that's a concern to you, we'd understand if you just chose not to participate. Uh, a few other things just so you know coming up. In addition to today's a talk. Uh, we have another uh, major event, which is something again near and dear to Teddy's heart, which is um, uh, we're doing a symposium on uh, a week from Friday. Uh, this is not the PIPG symposium, this is Journal of Law and Innovation Symposium, but it's on uh, criminal law and innovation uh, all day on January 28th. Everyone is open to it. We're doing a co sponsored event on Section 230 and what uh, Penn Law alum Adam Kandu calls the libertarian case for regulating big tech that is noon thursday february 3rd we are co-sponsoring an event on race and privacy featuring our own anita allen at 4 30 on well, february 9th uh, we are tentatively scheduling an event on ai for monday february 21st at 4 30 and are lining up another career talk in february so um, there's uh this is part of a lot of the very active active stuff that we're doing as usual and we're delighted to have you here and delighted to be part of it now, Teddy, you were not that long ago um, a, a law school applicant who had worked in um, magazine pub well, public PR, magazine publishing, and administration <laughs> for a new uh, uh, for a life insurance company, an insurance company. How did you yeah. get from there to being a technology lawyer? I um. I was a little bit of a of a burned out undergrad, and I sort of didn't know what I wanted to do. I studied English literature, and I had a lot of fun. Um, and after that, I worked in the fashion industry, um, in PR, and in magazines. And I actually loved the people I worked with. I get a lot of questions like, "Was it like the Devil Wears Prada?" Like a lot of really smart, interesting people. I'm still good friends with many of them, but it wasn't the career for me. So I made a pivot, and I thought, you know, I've always been been interested in technology. Um, maybe I'll go jo try to join like a VC type of thing. And so I got this hybrid research role, support role. Um, New York Life has this internal VC group. And that was fine. Um, but nothing was sort of, I had rediscovered my intellectual itch, I guess, and my desire to be challenged and solve puzzles and, um, you know, just, learn. Um, and so a lot of my journey from that point, honestly, is, is, is stories of things that I did on a whim. I downloaded an LSAT on a lunch break um, and I decided to apply to law school uh, a little bit on a whim, a little bit because I thought this lines up with my skill set. Um, but I had no idea that this decision to go to law school could line up with this thought I had had of pivoting into the tech world. Um, I applied to a bunch of law schools. I got into some law schools. Um, and I think this is one of Professor Yu and my favorite moments of my life, which is uh, I was lucky enough to be admitted to Penn. And I was uh, I was working as, as an SAT tutor in that sort of weird limbo time between um, you know, deciding to go to law school and going to law school. Um, and I was standing on a train platform in Hastings on Hudson, which if anyone has, has ever been in the area, it's like a beautiful picturesque, uh, train station on, on the Hudson River and it was sunset and I got this email um, from from Penn Law and from Professor Yu saying uh, you don't need a STEM background to do this joint degree program at Penn where you can get a master's in computer and information technology uh, at the same time as your law degree and I thought well that sounds challenging and law school will be challenging enough and I deleted the email um, and five minutes later I fished the email out of my uh, deleted mail box and went this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to do this joint degree, and I'm going to be a tech lawyer. Um, and so, honestly, the person I really owe being a tech lawyer to is is Professor Yu. And uh, 
the joint degree program. Um, but it, it, it was it was also it's born of I had a lifelong sort of interest in technology and also was intimidated by it. Um, and when I got to college, I just, I was sort of exhausted by the, the and I, I think many of you can probably relate as high achievers, like you did so much in high school and the goal was to go to a good college. And for me, I went, I'm tired now. And so I didn't do a pivot and go, okay, now I'm going to pursue this interest in technology. Um, and I got really lucky that I had the opportunity to sort of correct that lost opportunity. Um, and, and focus my, my legal career in the tech space. Well, actually during your time here at Penn Law, you took advantage of an extraordinary number of opportunities. So you were active in PIPG, you were the, one of the conference co-chairs one year, yep. you received one of the public interest fellowships uh, and worked at the Berkman Klein Institute uh, Center at Berkman Klein Center at Harvard. Tell us about how you went through being a law student here and, and, uh, and the roles, how did you take advantage of the opportunities to get to where you wanted to go? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, there was a fire under me because I, I finally had this moment of, okay, here, there are opportunities now and now is your moment to seize them. You know, you, you had some regrets that you didn't maybe see them, you know, in, in, at the undergrad level. And so Penn has all these interdisciplinary resources, you know, and so I went to lunch events. I, you know, paid attention to, um, oh my God, what's the email that Dimitri would send out? The, the docket on the docket, is that what it's called? Um, but basically just sort of any, any source of information I could find um, on, on opportunities related to law and technology, um, I, I just tried to jump at. So as Professor, you mentioned, I joined PIPG um, and was was part of the co-chair of the symposium. Um, I decided to do the uh, public interest fellowship and and do as uh, do if, if you're interested in the joint degree, one of the bonuses is you get an extra summer. Um, and so I had the opportunity to do an in-house summer, a firm summer, and a um, a public interest summer, which was a, a really cool um, blessing and a cool opportunity. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think. I think the answer is really like I, I just kept my eyes and my ears open and you know I, I made connections with people like Professor Yu or Professor Dahl um, in, involved in the um, I, I did two clinics also um, I did both the IP clinic and the entrepreneurship clinic um, so I think my view was if I want to be a technology lawyer and Penn has any resources available to strengthen my case um, as to why someone who majored in English literature and worked, you know, for Versace and W Magazine um, should be taken seriously as a tech lawyer. And by the way, I actually think that those things have served me really well as, as I've moved, you know, forward in my career. Um, but I was nervous about my my street cred and my bona fides. Um, was if, if Penn has an opportunity to do something, I'm going to I'm going to try it. I'm going to, you know, show up to the meeting. I'm going to show up to the lunch and, and learn about it and, and sign up. So let's go through this one at a time. I'm curious. Your yeah. first year summer, you spent in-house at Autodesk. Yep. Um, some people may not know, be familiar with Autodesk. And can, can you tell us about that summer and what you got out of it? Yes. Autodesk is, is sort of this very big software company that I had never heard of before I went and worked there. Um, they have AutoCAD is, is, is the offering that maybe some of you have heard of, um, which is sort of design software. Um, you know, this is so beyond now where <laughs> I'm not a person with the talent to actually use their, their software, but um, like engineering design um, is often AutoCAD is one of the biggest um, programs for that. They also have some really cool like generative design, AI technology, um, a lot of stuff in the 3D printing space. Um, but so I was not personally interested in, in doing a judicial internship. I was, um, it, it, it just, it didn't appeal to me as much. I always thought that I wanted to be more of a transactional lawyer. Um, you know, if any of you have a fondness for sort of case law I envy you that that was not my my favorite aspect um and and so I I didn't a judicial internship and, and more case you know live case law wasn't the most appealing to me so I thought okay I'd like to go in-house I'd like to go to a company I'd like to learn what the transactional side looks like it's harder to get a sense of that 
in our one-off classes. Um, and so the projects I did there were, were an interesting mix. Um, there was a really complicated joint venture at the time that Autodesk was um, involved in with Nike that, um, that my, my co-intern and I spent a lot of time literally just trying to solve the puzzle and unwind the pieces of the contract and how they even hung together um, in order to, and, and then, you know, got to sort of be part of um, the, the product counseling team, uh, you know, what, what their next steps were in moving forward with um, what they were negotiating with, with Nike at the time. And that was really my first exposure to like this thing I had hoped would be part of my practice, which is sort of contract as puzzle. Um, and understanding, you know, how the pieces hang together and making sure things are consistent. Um, and it ended up really lining up with, with some of the software programming that I learned uh, with the MCIT degree, which I think is just this funny, magical thing that happened, that the way I look at contracts now is, is very informed by um, this sort of like software engineering mindset. Um, then I did like this really bizarre products liability research project that was very theoretical and had to do with um, one of the things Autodesk at the time was considering offering, and I think they may offer now, is generative design assisted like design services. And they wanted to understand sort of some products liability implications of you know, if we offer you just our generative design software versus if we have personnel that are assisting you in applying the generative design to, you know, make a lighter 3D printed airplane seat and then the airplane crashes and people die, you know, where is the line on Autodesk's liability? Um, th those kind of questions, which suddenly took you know, took me from going, I don't understand what's happening in torts class to this is a real life interesting research implication. It's sort of the bleeding edge of what's going on. Like, has anyone argued, you know, generative design related cases? And the answer was sort of no, but we found some really cool, um, some, some really cool cases. So it was, it was a great opportunity to see, it was my first real exposure to see like where, where transactional and in-house like legal roles, like what they look at, what they think about um, and, and exposure to some cool sort of bleeding edge issues that, you know, what is it, Mrs. Paul's graph was, you know, was, was a little more attenuated um, from my day-to-day -day experience. So, I, yeah. So you spent your first summer in-house, which by the way, I think is a fantastic opportunity that not enough one else take a look into because from the perspective of a firm, it's their clients. I mean, an understanding, getting inside them, it's a pretty, it's a pretty unique opportunity because then you don't get it again because mostly in-house jobs wait until you have several years of experience at a firm. So it's a really sort of neat window you took advantage of. But then you worked for public interest work in a cyber law clinic in your second yeah. summer. Tell us about how your decision to get there and what you, how that was different from your first summer and what you got out of it. So as I mentioned before, I had this bonus summer in, in doing the, the MCIT degree. And I, I thought I got a really cool in-house experience. I'd like to do something different. I still don't want to do a judicial internship. I'll go to a firm next summer because that's what makes sense for the career path. And so I had this sort of hole of what you know, it's, it's, it's relatively rare to have a bonus summer in law school. The, the sort of standard path would be you know, judicial internship and then firm, at least for, you know, my, my classmates at Penn. Um, and so one of the things I, I, again, this was a little bit motivated by just keeping my ear to the ground of what the opportunities were at that Penn offered. I think we may have even talked about this, Professor Yu, I'm not sure, but I think I, I may have asked you, like, what, what should I do? I asked a lot of people what I should do, and, and I'm, I'm sure if I could catch you, you were on that list. Um, and so I'm not sure if, if, if the idea may have come from you or another professor, um, but it, it certainly was sort of in the, in the, in the pen, um, you know, I asked for help is, is kind of how I got there. I asked folks for, for suggestions or ideas. And I thought it was really cool to look at the pro bono side of where law and tech intersect um, because you know, as a person, I think I would like to make the world a better place. And I would also like to get to do work that is interesting and satisfying for me. 
And so I thought, what a cool opportunity, you know, Harvard is doing all this sort of cutting edge work um, on a pro bono basis. And, you know, some of it is academic in nature and some of it is, you know, in order to, um, you know, either help folks get access or to, um, to help folks without resources on these sort of cutting edge spaces really carve out what, what the legal frameworks will look like. So we had a client that was um, an artist that had part, an artist and scientist had partnered in this um, to create this artificial intelligence that could create artwork that was indistinguishable stylistically from the artist's work that, that she created. Um, and so one of the things that the clinic was thinking about was how do you break down IP ownership of artificial intelligence? There are, there's the outputs, there's the inputs, there's the algorithms, um, there's, you know, intermediate sets of, of outputs and, and training data and, and thinking about how to break down and sort of impose a legal framework on this, this cutting edge issue but also in support of this artist who otherwise had lived, you know, didn't have resources to, to pull in like a big firm, um, you know, to, to think about whether they should have ownership rights over some, some portion of this work. Um, we also did work at that clinic on whether um, like standards, things like construction standards that were incorporated by reference into law should be protected by copyright or if those should be free to access as part of as part of the law. Um, so it was it was a wide swath of, of issues again. Um, and and cool to think about it, you know, obviously going in-house, a company's obligation is to sort of, you know, maximize its its profits for its shareholders and, you know, to to run its business well. And it was a really cool opportunity to see what pro bono practice could look like, especially knowing that my plan was to go to a firm and to think about the ways that I could keep, you know, do, do pro bono work that would relate to tech. It was cool to start to see some of what those issues would look like. And what's fascinating, the issue you just mentioned about whether construction standards turned into law, get copyright protection was the subject of a Supreme Court case with a decision dropping in April 2010, which is Georgia versus public resource uh, work. And so it's fascinating to me. I mean, this wasn't some abstract uh, question. It was one that was gonna actually really get litigated and fully decided, so that's fabulous. So, but then your last summer, you summered at Kirkland and then you went and worked there for a little under two years. Tell us about that. And then you eventually you decided to move from yep. Kirkland's New York office to Fenwick and West in New York. Yep, yeah, so, I'm going to be very candid with you guys. My decision process of where to summer in New York, a, a major factor was how big is the summer class? And the Silicon Valley firms had like two people in their summer classes in New York in 2018 or whatever year this was. And that didn't sound fun to me. And I'm not saying that should be the metric that you use to make your decisions, but I'm being candid with you that that was a metric that I used. I thought, I don't want to be in a class of two. I'd like to be in a larger class. Um, and so at, it, now Cooley, Fenwick, Gunderson, Perkins have all really built out their presence in New York in the past several years. Um, but when I was, so that, that's, a, that's a material change in the market in New York for tech trends associates. There's been a strong market in California for a long time. The market in New York has majorly expanded in my experience in the past few years. Um, and so Kirkland did, does have a large tech transactions group for, um, you know, for a New York firm, and they had a, that group had a large presence in New York. Um, and so that was also really important to me. I didn't want to be, again, in a group of two people, both, you know, for sort of social reasons of what if I, you know, don't like one person, um, and also, you know, more opportunities to find a mentor with more variety. Um, so sort of from, from both sides, I thought a larger established tech transactions group with a strong reputation is, is what I wanna do. Kirkland has one of, had one of the larger New York groups. Um, there were a couple of folks who I had sort of, I, um, I reached out to an associate at the time, I think she was a second year, who had graduated from my undergrad class at Penn. We didn't know each other, but we had friends in common, hit it off right away. We actually work together now at Fenwick. Um, so I sort of found like 
uh, what someone who I think is a, a life will be a lifelong friend and mentor in my you know pre OCI networking process just by reaching out to someone who had the same um, you know undergrad alma mater as I did. So a plug for that thing that sounds really awkward that professors and career services tell you to do like just reach out to people they love to talk about themselves. I, my getting hired at Kirkland and then my move to Fenwick were both materially impacted by this person that I reached out to. So a, a plug for taking people seriously when they recommend that. Um, and so uh, th this, this woman, a dean, put me in touch with a partner in the New York office. I spoke to him before I went to went through OCI. And so I, I sort of got a sense of what the practice breakdown was. Um, and at the time, the practice breakdown of the Kirkland Tech and IP Transactions Group in New York was a mix of mergers and acquisitions, support work, and licensing and standalone work. Um, and some of this probably sounds like Greek because this is not things that you spend time on in 1L. Um, but basically, like if uh, we represented private equity companies that were buying other companies. And if they were buying a software company, my job was more involved. If they were buying you know, a car wash, my job was pretty limited to thinking about like, do we have a brand issue here? Is there proprietary technology in this car wash? If not, it's pretty mellow. But if there was, if it was a software company, if it was, we had a client that was wanted to buy a, a like flying Ubers concept, um, things like that, where the technology is the value. Obviously, the tech lawyers on the deal is an important piece and doing diligence on the technology and on the contracts that relate to the technology is really important. You don't want your client to buy a company um, that doesn't actually own their technology. That was one side. The other side of their practice, um, outsourcing and, and some licensing. Um, and so that sounded good to me. I thought, great. And Kirkland has this great reputation. It's, you know, a top tier firm. Um, so I went, I had a fun summer. I really liked the people in the group I worked with. Um, and I actually, I mean, I had a great almost two years there. Um, but what the Kirkland Tech and IP practice has evolved to a little bit over my time there was being much more heavily m and focused. And I, as a person who is particularly interested in like the software space, the AI space, you know, self-driving cars, maybe flying Ubers, all of these, all of these sort of more bleeding edge issues. Um, when your client base is, is private equity, you're often doing more businesses to acquire more mature portfolio companies. And I wanted to have options in my long-term career to maybe go back in-house. And so in order to be sort of a top candidate for an in-house position, there are certain kinds of experience that are really valuable. Um, and M&A diligence experience is not top of that list. Licensing and standalone is really top of that list. And Fenwick is a firm that represents tech companies. That's really their bread and butter, you know, sort of from startups to Amazon and Apple. Um, and so the market was really hot for lateral, even junior associates. And I saw an opportunity again, you know, making up for, for 18 year old Teddy being oblivious. I saw an opportunity to set myself up to have a broader set of options in my long-term career. So it's, it's not that I have decided firmly I will never try to make partner at a law firm, but I decided to make a move that would give me exit options if I didn't want to make partner at a law firm to go in-house at a tech company, to join a startup, um, you know, to to be to get involved in the VC space. Um, and so now my practice is really 50-50. And I, you know, I was on a negotiation call before this call uh, for a client that has a software uh, the, the, they're, we're doing an exclusive license in the like automotive dealership technology space. And they have this proprietary software that they've developed and they forked it and they have a buyer for an exclusive license for this one vertical. And I, you know, I, I spent my morning like thinking through these like really cool issues of like this software has been forked and how do we make sure that, you know, your license is to the right parts of it and what if some of it overlaps and then, you know, thinking through these business considerations with my client of, 
okay, you know, how is your compensation in this deal structured and what do we need to make sure is include in your earnout down the line if, if they do a really good job of monetizing and commercializing their license? How do we make sure that they have the right obligations to commercialize this license so you can earn all of your upside? Um, and I, you know, it, it was it was fun. It, it, was, it was really fun. So. So I'm happy with that move. And, and that was a very long story. Um, so I hope some of you have gotten a nice nap. Um, but I think that's the answer to your, to your question. No, I think it's a great answer. I mean, thinking about um, a career, not just a job, is something that everyone encourages you to do. When I was in business school, they drilled this into you. When I was in business school, they said, um, your next job search starts the moment you accept your current job. And many people don't, they go station to station and don't realize, for example, certain in-house, you know, certain law firm jobs don't trans don't transfer in-house, you know, like, like due diligence and mergers and acquisitions. Now you see them on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, but you don't see them, you know, it doesn't actually lead that way, which is fine, as you say, if you want a long-term career in a certain kind of practice. But if you're interested in, in possibly going in-house, particularly in different job, some things don't travel geographically, some things don't travel from firms to in-house. And I think it's really smart of you to think about that. So moving past the career a little bit, before we open up the floor to questions, I like asking people who come, is, give us an example of some emerging issue or some hot new topic that you're tracking uh, that's just coming on your radar, uh, that, that on the cutting edge, which we here in the law schools may not even, we're trailing behind, we don't even have on our radars yet. Uh, I mean, folks, Folks deeper into this than I at Fenwick, there's there's such a long list. I mean, I think the um, the vehicle space, there's a lot happening at Fenwick right now that I'm actually trying to get more involved with, both on the self-driving side, on the electric side. Um, you know, especially working with this client right now, there's a lot of like OEM manufacturers in China and things going on there um, that I, I think are going to be really interesting. I also am actually working right now a lot on... Um, totally unrelated things to do with influencer marketing um, and the FTC's position on influencer marketing is continuing to evolve. And we've been advising a client lately um, that is bringing a platform um, to the US market where the platform, their model is going to be to have relationships with influencers and then offer those influencers to brands as part of the deal to sell through their platform. Um, and so, you know, different sort of different ways to look at um, influencer space. And then another thing that the group has been talking about a lot that I actually haven't been super close to, but is just this NFT space that I'm sure you're all thinking about and hearing about. Um, and some of what we talk about in our in our weekly meetings on it is still making me scratch my head and, and give me a headache. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap my head around it soon, I hope. Um, you know, but some of it is, is there's, you know, this, the crypto, the blockchain space, NFT space, um, you know, I think, I don't think that's, I think that's on the law school trainer. Obviously I took a FinTech challenge course with, um, oh my God, who taught it? It'll come to me. That's embarrassing. But I, I took a FinTech challenge course my, my third year. Um, so honestly, I think, you know, having CTIC at the law school, I think Penn is more dialed into these issues than, than other law schools might be. You know, I think Penn is a place where people are thinking about business and technology and law as integrated issues, um, you know, in a, in a really sort of cutting edge way, especially for a big academic institution. But those are, those are some of the things that are making my head hurt lately or that, you know, I can't just Google the answer that I have to sort of <laughs> think, think through that we have, you know, not, not just me, but the Fenwick teams are sort of thinking through um, these, these issues as they evolve. Well, that's fabulous. Well, um, we've, uh, this has been great conversation. At this point, I would like to open it up to any of the students to ask you any questions they may have. And please don't be shy. Uh, Manish. Uh, hi, Teddy. Uh, thanks and for uh, joining. Manish, would you please turn your camera on when you ask the question? It'd be nice. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, hi, thanks for joining us. Um, I guess I had a question about, uh, I guess outside of the clinic, what classes would you recommend taking to pre prepare yourself for a career in like, I guess, IP transaction? That's, that's a great question. Um, so 
I mean, candidly, I think the clinics are, are top of my list if you're interested in transactional practice. Um, I just think those are those are some of the best ways to get exposure. Um, I think another thing to consider is to use your opportunity to get credit for courses outside the law school to think about taking like entrepreneurship or, or a class along those lines. Um, I think entrepreneurship is actually over at the engineering school. Um, that was, and obviously that was high on my priority list as a joint degree student, but I, I believe the law school lets you count a couple of credits from other schools. So that's something to consider. At the law school, there you go. See, the, the, the man with the answers. Um, at the law school, I, I my feeling is, is kind of take what interests you. Um, more than anything else, you know, I took, um, I mean, I, I, I guess my, my, my big plug would be professor, you, what's, what is, what is the class advanced topics in law and technology? Is that what it is? We have taught that in the past. We actually are not teaching it this year. Okay. So I take it back. Don't take that class. Done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, 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 I think you know, or I mentioned I took FinTech Challenge. I think part of it is, is their, their cert, you know, their sort of one-time offerings or once in a while offerings or sort of visiting professor offerings. Um, so I would keep an eye open for anything that sounds like techy and particularly interesting to you. Other, you know, like I took evidence, I took tax, um, it was fine. I, you know, I, some of it was like, what fits in my schedule and how many, you know, some, some of it for me was honestly about finding a balance, especially doing the engineering degree at the same time. Um, but I, you know, I think it's, I think it's look for experiential classes, look for any classes that are sort of, you know, one-time offerings or, you know, occasional offerings that specialize um, in law and tech. Like I actually didn't end up taking privacy because it didn't fit my schedule, but like that's, that's a great class to take. There's a high demand for privacy attorneys if it interests you, if you're not super interested in it right now, you don't need to be, a, you know, you don't need to be a privacy expert day one at your big law job. You'll learn a lot on the job about what types of privacy considerations are important. So like if tax, if you want to learn tax, like take the class. If you want to take evidence because you're terrified for it on the bar as I was, um, you know, take evidence. Um, I, I think sort of experiential, I'm repeating myself now, but, but you know, experiential and, and specific tech topics. And otherwise, I think anything that sounds cool or fun, like, you know, as long as you can tell a story in an interview of your interest in technology and in a way that's compelling and genuine, your course roster doesn't need to be 100% tech and IP courses. I guess like the IP survey course is, is a good one. Um, I did have an interview for a firm I didn't end up going to in this lateral process where they were like, you know, we don't normally make offers to people that didn't take copyright, um, but then they made me an offer, um, but I didn't like their attitudes. <laughs> Are there any classes you, looking back you wished you'd taken that you didn't? I mean, maybe privacy as much to take another class with you with anything though. Um, it just, it didn't, it didn't fit my schedule. You know, like copyright is fascinating. But again, it was, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. Um, and, and I really, I think I did a really good job of, of finding experiential credits um, and, and you know, finding advanced topic, you know, the advanced topics in, in law and technology, the FinTech challenge. Um, I think I did hit those, um, you know, so you know, I, I don't remember now what the alternatives were, if there were others that I missed out on. Um, but I, I think the clinics really stand out for me as sort of a, a, a key uh, a key bellwether of, okay, is transactional practice going to be right for me? Um, and I know those are a little bit competitive, but those, that's, that was my, um, that was my, my, my certainty in the transactional path, I think, was cemented by doing clinics. Fantastic. Any other questions? Moyo, and please turn your camera. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'm 
curious to hear more about how your experience is practical in the humanities and in fashion and VC work prepared you for what you do now, because you kind of hinted at that. And also, um, did California ever appeal to you as a market? Because I'm, I'm really itching to go back there personally. Yeah, so I'll take your second question first. Um, I'm not a Cali girl. I spent a summer out there and I'm a New York girl and, you know, people just have their preferences and, and that was mine. Um, I'm really thrilled that the New York market has expanded its, its appetite and its, its, um, its tech transactions opportunities. Um, but th I think that, that that's just a personality thing. And my family is here and, you know, it, it, that, that's, real, that's personal, that's not sort of career-based. Um, in terms of the humanities background, the fashion degree, um, not fashion degree, the fashion job and the English degree, it's been a long morning already. <laughs> so it, it's, it's a few different things, right? I think critical thinking and, um, you know, as, an, as a lit major, right, you read all the time and you think about what things mean. And as a transactional lawyer, you know, yes, I'm reading contracts, but as I'm in negotiations and as I'm, you know, wordsmithing language with opposing counsel, I think being, having a strength in reading comprehension and in language and in, um, you know, being able to offer alternative ways to phrase things um, and, you know, to, to get at, to get at concepts with language, um, you know, that, that's valued. That's valued by the partners I work for. That's valued by my clients. Um, it, it's something that I think ref, just reflects well, having facility and strength in, um, in, in language. And then the fashion piece, I have brand clients. I represent um, fashion influencers. I, you know, I also, so I, I'm able to connect with them. You know, I was on a call with a client recently and they had a wall of shoes behind them. And I was like, oh, you know, it reminds me of my days in the W fashion closet. And that's not a huge thing, but it created a moment of genuine connection on a personal level. And, you know, that just helps to elevate trust and, and you know, it's a relationship business in a lot of ways. Um, and so I've had these just concrete moments of relationship building based on an understanding of the fashion space and understanding of brand protection and understanding of brand value. You know, if someone name drops a brand, you know, being familiar with that. And that's, that's not necessary. It doesn't have to be fashion. It doesn't have to be anything. I think the point is anything you can bring to your legal practice that can help you make a connection with your clients, with your peers, with the partners you work for to help sort of solidify your personal brand, you know, your personal reputation, your credibility. Um, I remember in one of the first days in internet law with Professor Yu, which is another class I recommend actually, that was a great one. Um, he talked about, you know, jargon is, is currency and, and jargon is how we sort of signal to each other that, you know, we're, we're legit, we're on the inside, we understand what's going on. Um, and so, you know, for me, fashion is a place where I have some familiarity with the jargon in addition to tech. So it just helps me, you know, get, be taken seriously and build that rapport. And that could be in, in anything that you have a background in. That's fascinating. Thank you. you know, it's funny when I keep thinking, when I teach STEM students, especially with the undergrads, asking them to read 25 pages is like asking them to climb Mount Everest. You know, it's just, there's an interesting, your backgrounds combine that ability to engage with the text and do with it that way, and the technical background, which you were able to get here. I love the notion about jargon too. It's not just jargon the words, but also uh, names. You know, there's names that are specific to different industries to, within a firm. You know, everyone in the firm knows the name of their managing partner inside and out, but if, you know, they're almost often quite not well known outside the firm to the same extent or who the key clients are, and, you know, it's always struck me, a lot of this is avoiding that deer in the headlights look where someone mentioned something of the lack of recognition versus um, knowing where you are is actually really huge. I mean, it's, it's subtle, but it's one of those things that you really get by sort of getting experience and moving around. So that's, that's interesting. Um, any other questions for Teddy? Do I get a bonus point for remembering the uh, the one L, the one L jargon conversation? You get more than one bonus point. 
So, so the question I've got now is um, uh, just to throw something at you. So I think you did a great job talking about how you've gotten to here. And you start to think about in-house beyond what, how do you think about your, how do you think about your current position, your possible next move and, and where your future is going to take you? I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, well my, line that. That yeah. <laughs> my line that you've heard me say before is I like to think about skating where the puck is going um, to, to steal from to steal from Mr. Gretzky. But it, it's, it's true. You know, the, the market is evolving. As I mentioned before, the New York market has rapidly expanded even since I graduated from Penn. Um, and so the appetite for, you know, tech savvy lawyers and tech fluent um, transactional attorneys. Now, there's always been a market in the patent space, obviously, but the, the market in this sort of transactional space and in the in-house space has changed and expanded really quickly. Um, and so that's something I definitely think about of that sort of a, a clear potential path is, you know, we have all these tech clients and consumer product clients, you know, Founder represents Amazon and Apple and Peloton and you know, people definitely make the choice to go in house at those clients or elsewhere. I have friends that have gone to, you know, to Facebook, which now is now Meta, um, or to all sorts of places. So I think that's that's one thing I think about is that's a path that is available. Um, I think the other thing I think about is that you know, so much has changed in the past three or four years. Things are going to keep evolving, and so. Um, the other thing I think about is sort of keeping an eye and ear on, you know, what is Fenwick's client base look like? What sort of businesses are cropping up? Where is there interesting innovation happening? Are there roles that are not sort of, you know, like I have friends that are product counsel. I have friends that are, you know, associate general counsel or whatever the title is. Um, are there roles that aren't sort of standard roles that exist yet that would be a good fit for someone like me that has, you know, this specific type of technical background married with this law firm background? Um, you know, is there like a hybrid business legal role um, of some type that, you know, would, would be interesting for me? Um, and product counsel obviously can be that. It, it sort of depends. Um, different firms and different or different companies do things different ways. But I think so. I, I think it's it's a three pronged approach, right? One is staying at a firm and trying to make partner is something to consider. Um, one is there's this path of a sort of existing, not standard, but existing set of understood in-house roles. Um, and then third is, is there some new option that's evolving that will be available or that I could work to create, you know, and could pitch um, based on what I'm, I'm seeing, you know, as the legal needs of, of my clients um, or, you know, the, as, as new types of, of things are happening. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> So you all heard it here. That's where the puck is going, according to Teddy Josephson. The puck is going to Teddy is gonna is gonna keep an eye on the pulse. It's a, it's a, it's a really it's really uh, it's really helpful, guys. I'm sorry, I don't have I don't have more to offer there. <laughs> well, frankly, you know what? Partly is we make a lot of predictions about where the puck is going. Um, the only guarantee is you make predictions a lot. Most of them will be wrong, you know. And so it's just the nature of it. It's just a uh, keeping an eye on things, being flexible and not falling in love with any of them, just uh, being more right. broad-minded about them. Anyway, uh, we are toward, going towards the end. We have room for a, a question more too, if anyone has one. If so, please let me know. Seeing none, I will let you have the last question, well, last qu thing to say. What advice would you give, you could say people who are starting out and trying to figure out, because we have a lot of 1Ls here, or is there something you wish you had been told that you know now that you that you know now you wish you knew back when you were a, a law student? Yeah. So one super practical thing that came to mind is um, to go back to what we talked about at the very beginning of our conversation. I did an in-house summer, my first summer. Um, I really recommend looking into that if you think this, you know, 
transactional work in law and tech is something that interests you. Um, what I wish I had fully understood at the time, so I would have had less anxiety about it, is it is very much a self-directed search. I found my job on LinkedIn just by search, like, I was about to say Googling, but you don't Google on LinkedIn, by searching um, for legal intern roles. And second, the time frame is much later and very different from the judicial internship uh, time frame. All of my friends had their job locked down before I even interviewed for mine. Um, so those are super practical things that I wish I fully understood as a 1L, as someone taking a sort of different approach to what career services was used to. Um, and maybe they've seen more of that recently and, and have, have built out their advising on that front. Um, so that's just, just a, a small practical thing. Um, I think also, I want to sort of, I was optimistic that the demand was there and, and the market was there um, in the technology transaction space. Um, and I think maybe for you all, that isn't even a question, I, I think, but I, I think there's a really big appetite um, that, that isn't going to be waning in the next two years. Um, I get recruiter emails every day looking for lateral tech transactions associates. Um, you know, I do recruiting interviews for incoming um, summer associates, you know, all the time. There's competition for um, strong tech and IP candidates um, in the New York market and I think in other markets. So I sort of wasn't sure, you know, and I think there was probably reassurance at the time and I was just nervous, um, but I wish I had felt more confident, I guess. That, that this was that this was a good plan, um, and I think there really is a lot of a lot of appetite for strong candidates um, in the space. And all it really takes to be a strong candidate in the space is like an excitement and a willingness to learn about the tech stuff in addition to the legal stuff. Like that's you know you you can learn about anything. If if I get a new client and they have a business that I've never heard of, I start with their website. And then I ask them questions about it. It's not, you know, it's not, there's no special sauce. It's just sort of being like humble and hungry and willing to learn. And I guess that's my last thing is the best thing that doing the joint degree ever did for me was it helped me get, well, not it helped me, it humbled me. It turned me into a person, you know, I, I had my first big moment of let's start to seize opportunities. My second big moment was let's get comfortable not knowing. Um, you know, let's, let's get off of this high achiever mindset and onto this, the way to grow is to ask questions of people that know more and know better and have tried and failed and learned from it, or, you know, have succeeded if they've never failed fine, but what did they do? Um, I was, a, I, I never liked to appear to not know things before I, I went to law school and engineering school. And, um, the thing that has served me the best maybe as a junior in my legal career is just being really willing to say, I don't understand. Can you explain it to me? Please help. And I have found so many mentors that way by just asking for help when I didn't know what to do. Um, so I guess that's, that's really my, that's not specific to law and tech, but it, it's, you know, if you're willing to be humble and ask questions and have an appetite to learn this stuff, then that, you know, that's kind of all, all you need. And if you take the classes and, you know, can, can tell your story about your legitimate interest, all the better. Um, so. Well, I think that's a terrific note to end on. Uh, thank you very much for spending time with us. Uh, I would normally do this in the classroom where if we're in person to say, uh, please join me thanking Teddy for spending this time and giving us uh, such so much insights on how to get this launched. We'll have to settle for doing it uh, virtually the way Boyan is doing it now, but thank you very much. And uh, it's wonderful to see you again, and we uh, look forward to bringing you back in person uh, when COVID permits it. So. Thanks so much, and thanks for, for having me, guys. And I mentioned this at the beginning, but in case some folks join later, um, really do feel free to reach out to me. Um, in the near term, you know, in the next couple of years as you're going through OCI, I am always happy to be a resource um, to, to Penn students who are interested in the space. Um, I, I think my email is somewhere available, but 
if it's not, um, it's it's T E D D I A N N E J at Gmail, or you can find my Fenwick email, um, which honestly I respond to more quickly these days. I'm always on that one. So you can find my Fenwick email um, on Fenwick, or if you caught my personal one, you can use that as well. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Teddy. So good to see you. So good to see you. And I can't wait to, to come see you guys in person. It was really, really a treat to, to get to get to be here. So thank you so much for having me. Thank well, you. Stay well. Stay well. Yeah, you we, guys too. Everyone stay safe. And Jake saying thank you to and Alice, but thank you very much. And we'll definitely have you back at a time awesome. when we can do this in person. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.